Morning, people. How are you doing? Welcome to episode 142 of the Sports Therapy Association podcast. My name is Matt Phillips. I'm the creator of One Chat Live. And as always, this episode is being recorded live on a Tuesday, 8 p.m. Uh, BST now, aren't we? On the STA YouTube channel, which is the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel. Um, and I should say, first of all, actually, it's just it's not on my little notes here. I just say thank you very much mm -hmm. to everyone who subscribed to the channel because we've hit a thousand now. I think we're way past a thousand. So that's really humbling. That's really cool, considering I'm not even sure how many sports therapists there are in the uh, UK, but it's great. It's it's risen from probably two years ago. I think we're down in 400 or something. So it's really, really um, encouraging. And um, we don't do this for money, as hopefully um, you realise. Um, it's a non, it's a charitable organisation. It's a non-profit making um, uh, business. So we purely do this to provide support for soft tissue therapists and uh, to give them um, a shoulder for support in the hard times and help them celebrate the good times and just to share good practice and um, basically raise standards in our industry. So it's great to, to have um, tangible evidence that we are reaching out to people and you guys are subscribing. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can show us some love by going to the YouTube channel and subscribing there and obviously subscribing on your preferred podcast app as well especially apple Podcasts. if you can subscribe there and leave a rating that'd be amazing because that just means um, we appear even higher in the google rankings and things like that so anyway thank you very much um a thousand and we're looking forward to reaching two thousand we are recording live so people are already um entering the live lounge which is wonderful to see um Going on there, let's move that across a bit. If you do want to join us live, like I say, just pop along to the live lounge, uh, to the YouTube channel at eight o'clock. Um, people are flocking in tonight. It's very interesting to see. Let's bring a few people up here. When you do join us, then we can bring your name and logo up onto the screen. So there's a nice bit of networking there. Glenn Murphy, as always, is first through the door. Good to see you, Glenn. Glenn says, evening, playmates. Hope all is well. Everything's fine, Glenn. Thank you very much. A little bit for seeing you. Nikki Mansfield, um, evening, Glenn. Evening, everyone. Not happy with this return of winter. It's lovely down in... Um, in Lance, Lansing Rotty, as we call it, on the south coast. So sorry where you are, Nikki, but it's gorgeous down here. Lovely one today. Um, Gary Benson, founder of the STA, is in the house as well. Hello, all. Looking forward to this one. Aren't we all, definitely. Uh, Penny from Soma Sports Massage Therapy has joined us again. Coming very much a regular there, Penny. Great to see you. Thank you very much. A few excellent questions last week. Brian Huxley is here. Cecily Hislop as well is here. Cecily says, evening all. It's my first live session. Fantastic. Great for joining us. Thanks, Cecily. Uh, curled up on the sofa with a cuppa and looking forward to it. That's how we roll here. You just make yourself your favourite hot beverage or something maybe mildly al alcoholic, if you fancy. And um, I can assure you each time it'll be something relevant to soft tissue therapists. Um, so, yeah, that's great to hear you've joined us, Cecily. Great news. Um, right then, so what are we doing? It's the we've reached the final part of this month's focus on the lower back. Um, as has become customary now, I do try and choose a focus point for each month. So the kind of shelf life is longer. And this month it has been the lower back. For months and months and months ago, we've worked from the ankle upwards um, and we've reached the lower back now. So let me just bring up so you can see what we've had so far, a little resume in of what we had. We started off at the beginning of the month um, in episode 140 with guest Owen Lewis, co-founder of Born to Move, um, who shared um, his insight into common misconceptions regarding lower back pain. And we did that by having a look at the 2020 BJSM paper, Back to Basics, 10 Facts Every Person Should Know About Back Pain. Um, and it's great to hear again. Thank you for everyone who emails me. The fact that you didn't know this paper is wonderful because there is a danger, especially if you work in the business and you do a podcast and you're just surrounded by people in the know. I imagine falsely that everybody knows that paper and it's, and it's what's the word? It's just, it's irresponsible of me to think that everybody knows it. So it's wonderful that I reach people um, with the help of Ern Lewis who aren't familiar with that paper. It's a wonderful summary of where you, it's a guide you can interpret things differently but it's a great guide of where you could possibly be if you want to call yourself evidence informed um, in 2023 and that was three years ago now so yeah um, if you're interested in that then obviously it's available on all podcast apps and if you want to watch the video then you can go to youtube sports therapy association channel or you can go to the sta.co.uk i'll put all of the videos and show notes up on there as well um, and then the week after because we do go out every week um, this was last week. We spoke to the marvellous Michelle Lyons, women's health physio and creator of CelebrateMooliEbrity.com. Does everybody remember in the live lounge what Mooliebrity means? Fantastic word. Um, and Michelle Lyons um, discussed female lower back pain and the potential women's health factors we should be aware of 
when working with female clients. Um, an exceptionally great episode. I haven't had the pleasure of spending time with Michelle before, wonderful educator, and the information in there just blew me away. It was great. If you haven't listened to that, um, I really would do so. This magnificent summaries of things we should be aware of um, and, and how women are not little men. I mean, it's, it sounds ridiculous to say that, but because of research focusing um, on, on male sample uh, populations often, uh, it just hasn't been considered before, these, these things which we should be bearing in mind um, when we have female patients. And obviously probably most people out there, half your patients are more are gonna be women. So excellent episode to update your knowledge and information. And so we arrive at part three. Um, very much looking forward to this. We're bringing back um, the, t well, I say the team, it was originally gonna be the team, the co-hosts of the Back Pain podcast. Um, unfortunately, one half of it, I don't know if he's a brain or the, or the beauty, I'm not sure, I have to check with my guest the other half, but yeah, one half is unfortunately unavailable uh, to join tonight, last minute, little emergency, so um, everything's fine, but you just couldn't join us. So we're going to have the other half, uh, Dave Elliott, so Rob Bevan can't be with us, unfortunately. Dave Elliott is going to be um, solo flying tonight and uh, going to present us with some uh, more wonderfully intriguing lower back pain case histories obviously which he and colleague rob have loads of being the hosts of the back pain podcast you can imagine how many they've mounted up so if you're at home um this was a popular request get your detective hats on get a bit of pen and paper out or maybe your stylus or ipad whatever it is um and yeah join uh, me as i talk to dave elliott elliott and we look through some interesting lower back pain case histories let's bring him up now Hey Dave, how are you doing? Hi Matt, I'm good, thank you mate, how are you? I'm excellent, um, I'm, I'm glad there was a little bit of um, worry earlier on, wasn't it, when we found out that our Rob couldn't come, but you just were like, yeah fine, I'll do this earlier, no problem at all. Yeah, they will never notice, I'll just talk in two separate <laughs> voices. Um, you were right by the way earlier, Rob is indeed the brain. Oh, um, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm simply um, uh, the add-on, uh, <laughs> the plus one, however, I'll do my best uh, to see you guys through tonight, yeah. I thought you were going to say that, yeah, you're definitely the beauty, because normally we say the brain's in the beauty, don't we? So that's very... I was this very... close, and then I realised we had video <laughs> on tonight. I thought there's no point lying. Ah, oh, to the 3,000 or so that downloaded it, you could have got away with it. Anyway, yes, I'm <laughs> uh, really glad that you joined us, really. Um, thanks for stepping up. And obviously, we wish uh, Rob all the best, and hope that the predicament he's in at the moment is sorted very soon, and he's back with us soon. So anyway, um, I'm just saying, I, I, my goal with this whole podcast, and the reason we've done it for 142 weeks in a row now, is because I want to reach out the good word of people like yourself to new people. I mean, I love deeply my hand on heart to the people who join us live. And some people in, in the lounge tonight have joined us literally for probably nearly all 142 weeks. Um, wow. But it's the 3,000 or so who download it who I don't even know their names, who are in the shadows, who I'm really hoping that they don't know our guests. If you listen to this, I hope you've never heard of the Backbane podcast because just like last week or the week before, um, I, I shared that paper with you, which proved so popular, um, the BJSM 2020 paper. This week as well, it's going to be another great addition to um, your kind of tools by um, meeting and listening to the Back Pain podcast. For people who don't know about it, um, Dave, how did it, how and when did it all start? So the Back Pain podcast uh, began just before lockdown, um, strangely. Uh, Rob and myself, we're both practicing chiropractors. We have been for uh, 11 or so years now. We own uh, multidisciplinary clinics at opposite ends of the country. He's over in Siren Sester in the Cotswolds, and I'm in Chelmsford in Essex. Day in, day out, we were giving the same repeated information. Um, obviously, things do change over time, but the same base info exercises, uh, prompts, and support is given to our patients. And you guys as therapists will have the exact same thing. You think, how many times today can I remind someone that movement is okay? Cry, if I have to tell one more person how to properly, uh, I don't know, do a bird dog or whatever it is, um, uh, we realize that actually there's a better way of getting this information rather than just one-on-one -on -one multiplied many times. We could do this one to many, and a podcast seemed like the best way to do that. And fortunately, no, this sounds terrible. Fortunately, COVID happened. Um, not what I mean, but what happened, people became very adept with Zoom and uh, video conferences like this. It became the norm, whereas in 2019, if you said, I'm going to log on and sit and watch two talking heads on the computer, it, it may have been a bit weird. 
and also people became very comfortable with talking via Zoom or um, our various podcast mediums. So instead of driving to people's houses, that there was a, a good three or four months where me and Rob drove all around the country to people's houses. We'd meet up, we'd set up all this video and um, audio equipment in people's living rooms. It looked like radio too sometimes. I would interview and then we'd spend another two hours taking it all down and loading it up into the car. Whereas now we send a Zoom link and people are pretty nonchalant about talking into their computer. It's a norm now. So that, with that backing, we grew and grew. Yeah, that's great news, and 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 we can we we can relate to that because it was out of it was through COVID that the Sports Derby Association podcast happened because suddenly therapists were like, "Do I need gloves? Am I supposed to wear the mask? Where are you getting your gloves from?" And there was a lot of kind of state of actually, I need to talk to my fellow therapists now, as opposed to thinking, "Oh, I don't want them to get any of my patients." So I, again, it's weird, isn't it, saying thanks to COVID, and obviously mm. there's some horrific and continues people with terrible problems because of it. But I think we can all agree it did kind of open up and improve this communication and maybe in a way help healthcare because the whole kind of online consultation and everything made us realize a little bit more the importance of the subjective and seeing it to someone's home and seeing them as a person as opposed to jump up on the couch and do this you know do this with your knees so no really positive thing I've forgotten that you kind of yeah flourish because of COVID it's strange isn't it Indeed, it has certainly forced the issue of tech. I, I must now say we have now evolved, Matt. We're now the um, the back pain and injury podcast. We got up to about 120 episodes, and it wasn't we didn't have enough uh, uh, <laughs> further option for just back pain. Um, but actually, we figured there was so much else that we could get out to that same. Um, audience, whether it be people suffering, uh, most comorbidities exist, back pain with something else, with something else. Um, and also we've got quite a large therapist um, uh, listenership as well. So we figured the more we can put out to these people, um, yeah, the better it's going to be. It looks like we still need to change the website. <laughs> I was going to say, you the, said uh, that, and I was <laughs> like, oh <laughs> no, I just let you down because I just took a so, screenshot of this now, yeah. No, that's interesting because, yeah, I mean, let's just bring up, I'll put this on, we can still hear you when you are hidden behind your um, website. Mm -hmm. Just for people listening to the podcast, I'm just putting a splash screen up of the of the website. So, um, yeah, .com, just checking. The back pain, my, my eyesight's gone downhill in the last week so much, I'm getting so old. The back pain podcast <laughs> .com, I have to dig out the glasses. Um, but, yeah, um, it's, it's, I noticed that you've got your providers map that's a lovely idea so people can literally like you just said you click on that enter your postcode and then you've got a kind of a group of people who you'd recommend them to go and see absolutely it's people who are in line um with the current research and therefore kind of our, our crowd um we wanted a, a badge of honor if you like these are they started off as just practitioners who had been on the podcast personally we said well if they're good enough to come on they're sort of okayed by us um then slowly as the word got out we've started to add in more and more practitioners so guys if you're listening um, and you want to be put on the provider map um, do give us a message and we'll we'll add you to it we've got i, th I think we're at about twenty thousand listens per per wow, month excellent. um we're getting up there so it does go to a lot of ears um and we do get a lot of hits on that provider map that's excellent that's really cool to know um, and that's the other thing I think which has happened, thanks, I know it's happened, it's been exhilarated by COVID, but I don't know whether you've noticed it, because you will know, being a chiropractor, both of you are chiropractors, and we talked about this in the last um, episodes that I did with you and Rob, and then Rob by himself a while ago, mm -hmm. chiropractors, and I think still today, chiropractors still get unfairly tarnished with that same brush, where I still see in social media, oh, they're a chiropractor, ha, 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 all they do is click bones and stuff like that. Um, and because of COVID and more communication and more podcasts and, and multidisciplinary guests on each other's shows and things, then I'm wondering whether you have seen a better interpretation or a better description of what a chiropractor does. Has it improved? Yeah, I think the, the perception of what chiropractic is is starting to open up, whether it's COVID related or, or just the, the introduction of more interdisciplinary um, uh, events. I was on. A, I was actually on uh, Radio Four the other week um, with a, with a physiotherapist who, again, had never talked to a chiropractor and only had the the rhetoric handed down through the NHS over the years. So had a pretty dim view of us. As soon as I under, uh, I explained what we did and how we did it, it was like, oh, 
I'd agree on that. Um, again, like you said, I thought you just click backs. I mean, part of that is our fault, Matt, because we do click a lot of backs. Hey, look, there's no there's no shine away from it. That is a, a large portion of our skill set, but it's not the only tool we have. There's soft tissue, there's movement, there's rehabilitation, all of which should be muddled in with that modality. It's just trying to get that message out there. It's not just back clicks. And I do blame YouTube because it's the Hollywoodification of treatment. Um, and it doesn't matter what, uh, what kind of therapist you are, unfortunately, to have the YouTube guys come and film me in clinic would be dreadfully boring because it's all incredibly safe. <laughs> no one's in the key. No one's at um, uh, near death risk. Um, so no one's going to click on that. So they have to Hollywoodify this. And you'll see that with Cairo, Osteo in the States. Um, it doesn't matter if you, uh, there was a, a dentist in the States who was filming himself whilst doing dentistry. He did get knocked up. Don't do it, kids. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's this forced... Um, uh, yeah, Hollywoodification. I'm going to stick with it. I've said it three times. I might as well. Um, good, which good. unfortunately portrays quite a false image of what people do behind closed doors. Yeah, and it's amplified, isn't it, by social media and the visuals just sell. It's all clickbait, isn't it? What you see. Um, mm. But uh, yeah, no, it's great. It's great, and it's it's wonderful that um, the lines are blurring a little bit because the more evidence informed you get, the more I think it's logical you have to move away from just your one kind of hammer and one nail because you just know you're working with people. And it's going to take something different. So, and it's sports therapists as well, and sports massage therapists, the same thing. If you're if you're becoming more evidence informed, which hopefully our audience are, then you will start to be on the same page as your physio, your chiro, your osteo. Because if everyone's evidence informed, you're all going to be seeing from the same book. It's when you're still saying you're breaking down knots and you're improving circulation and all that sort of stuff. And if all you're putting out is kind of like pods on people's backs and taking photos of these kind of alien type readiness, you're not <laughs> going to, you just, I mean, it might help the odd patient, but you're just promoting and, and kind of exacerbating this image that all we do is kind of, you know, twist and pull and prod people. So that's no, good stuff. That's I'm right. feeling quite positive listening to you. It's good. Oh, excellent. Oh, well, I'm putting up a good front. I mean, I must say as well, for, um, for the sports therapists listening, the Back Pain Podcast, although we are two chiropractors, we've been absolutely intent from the beginning. It's not a chiropractic podcast. It is a back pain professional podcast. In fact, we're, if anything, a bit limiting and mean to chiropractors um, because we, we feel overprotect and overdo um, our um, unbiased nature. Um, so we've had, uh, yes, chiropractors, but physios, we've had sports therapists, we've had surgeons, GPs, loads of surgeons, actually. Um, and we try and uh, researchers, PTs, we try and have just the top people in their field um, to come in and talk about backs. Like you said, no matter what profession you're in, the basic tenets of, yes, some soft tissue work of varying degrees, each profession will have their own specialities. Um, that's fine. We don't have to amalgamate everything, but some soft tissue work, some tenets of movement, rehabilitative exercise, improvement in um, uh, lifestyle, if I can be that wafty, everything from diet to, um, uh, to self-talk is important when we're talking about pain. So those tenets should be the same no matter who you go to. And that's our big thing. You want to go see a back pain professional who, because that creates this paralysis of fear should i see a chiro a sports therapist an osteo a physio who and so what they end up doing is seeing no one because they don't want to get it wrong these patients so i think the more we can align ourselves as hi i'm a back pain professional it doesn't uh, this is a rob quote by the way so as, as if he was here um, <laughs> it doesn't matter what flavor it shouldn't matter rather what flavor of certificate you have on the wall because your basic tenets of good quality customer uh, patient and customer care should be the thing that we go by um yeah so that's a bit of a soapbox rant there apologies that's great um, it's a really yeah. good quote yeah rob we're feeling you in the studio even though you're not here yeah <laughs> i'm channeling him yeah, yeah. I'm just going to bring up on the screen like a, just a snapshot. All the podcasts can be listened to, obviously, on every app, but also on your website, there's access to them as well. And and people from the show will recognise some of the names there. I mean, at the moment, the latest one, I think, which should released one in the last couple of days, is Tennis and Golfers Elbow with Ian Gatt. But then we've got Jack March, who's been on the show before, um, last year, a couple of times, talking about polymyalgia rheumatica. Um, then you've got, uh, who else did I see on there? There was Andrew Jackson. Going a little bit back, talking about Severs and Os Oscar Schlatter's disease. So, 
yeah, it's definitely not just about back pain. So well renamed to the back pain and injury. Oh, there you go. You've, you've added it on there on the logo there. The back pain and injury <laughs> podcast. Yeah, well worth listening, people. And if you're, and again, if you're somebody listening to the podcast and you're looking for this podcast, you're looking for something else to fuel your interest and to free CPD, basically, because that's what we're talking about. The quality of guests on this and on the back pain podcast are giving you just a free hour of CPD. Um, honestly, I mean, I'm, I do courses myself and lots of the guests give courses. But number one, if you're really thinking, what should I do? Look, look at your free stuff, first of all, especially when we're entering a difficult year. Don't be, unless you're into gate analysis, and then you can obviously sign up for my gate analysis in May. That's fine. But if it's something else, and just look online, get the free stuff done. You know, there's so much quality information out there, thanks to COVID, which is weird, which um, therapists aren't um, making the most of. And if you've got colleagues who are therapists and you want to make their day, then share. Share this, share the Back Pain podcast. Um, you know, don't be spending your money before you've gone to the low-hanging fruits in terms of CPD. Anyway, right. Um, I just want to bring up this question from already we've got some questions in here and it's a good question i think you've kind of answered it but penny from soma sports massage therapy has just said when do we refer a client to have chiropractic treatment how to differentiate from referring to an osteopath what's the difference between the two yeah there you go one for you um that's a really good question um, was it penny um yes. uh, and when we get asked quite a lot hopefully 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 the difference is not very much Again, there should be some soft tissue. Uh, there might be some adjusting osteopath for them, something else, but it's, it's all a bit of a shunt. It's all a movement providing a window of opportunity for your body to heal and your nervous system to chill out a little bit so you can get back to doing whatever you should do. The problem is we're in professions that evolved about 100 years ago. So to be honest, and I think this might have actually been... Um, uh one of the the questions the answers off that is about you know this, this historical rhetoric bubbling up that's what it is it's we're talking the same language but using different words and that's where the we're saying the same words using different language um so instead of manipulations are what we call them adjustments well who cares do you move a joint to its paraphysiological space to provide a little pop and a relief of symptoms yes oh it turns out we're doing the same thing um Knowing a few uh, osteopaths who've come out relatively recently from BSO in London, they treat in a very similar manner. Their background, their anatomical knowledge is the same. I mean, look, I'm biased. I say go see a chiropractor, but most of it's personal preference. So I would say in your area, if there's a chiro or an osteo or physio who manipulates and that, that's where you're sending them to, you think that there's something more joint based that you want to get worked on, strike up a relationship or ask them a couple of questions. Hi there, info at Advanced Chiropractic. I'd love to send some people over to you. However, can you answer me? The, if you ask things like, what's the difference between you and a, uh, osteo? What's the difference? Um, how would you treat a patient that I send you with dot, dot, dot? That will give you a really good feel for them. And probably it will give you a good feel for the outcome that would that patient's going to get. Yeah, great answer. And, and indeed, yeah, great question, Penny. It's it's often, I don't know, there's dangers, there's pitfalls of it, but it's almost like go and see the person who, who suits you, whether it's the location. As long as that's the advantage of being evidence informed, if we're all keeping an eye, not just doing exactly what the research says, because we'd be doing very little if we only did what was supported by evidence. But if you're keeping an eye on it and updating your rhetoric and, and watching the way you're talking to patients and you're aware of the issues like catastrophization, you're aware of the BPS model as well as its limitations and all these sort of things, then that will affect everything you do with gentle tweaking. So as long as you are doing that, whether you specialize chiropractic or osteopath, it's kind of by the by a little bit. Um, so yeah, the person um doesn't matter what was it doesn't matter what flavor your certificate has beautiful i'm gonna have to make a t-shirt with yeah. that you look the same, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right okay right very excited so that's a little intro i'm i'm glad um, we've spent some time doing that it's a great podcast the back pain podcast loads of guests on there so uh, make sure you have a listen tonight in lower back pain part three you've got some case histories for us haven't you that's right so what we wanted to do was go down the um the diagnostic route, so try and lead you down a diagnostic pathway. I think rather than getting into the weeds of treatment, because that's going to be very specific, as we've just discussed, 
that there will be some basic tenants that should be across the board, but there's no point getting into specifics of what a Cairo would do versus a, um, a sports therapist, et cetera. So we wanted to go down the garden path of diagnostics. We've got three cases for you to go through um, with very similar starts and different branches for you to guess. So I'll try and pause at the right moments and allow you to write questions or your answers into the, um, into the group chat. Wonderful. Yeah. So that's that's you people in the group chat there. Um, I've had feedback that was lovely. A lot of you are sitting down there with your pen and paper. So that's fine. I mean, as long as you're happy and I'm pretty sure you're a confident bunch, just feel free to ask questions, share, have a little conversation amongst yourselves if you start working this along uh, along at the same time that uh, Dave explains it. So, right. Case history number one. Fantastic. Uh, I think we, we call this um, <laughs> therapist goosebumps, if any of you are old or young enough to have read the Goosebumps books um, back in the day that you'd sort of like turn to whatever page. Um, yeah, let's go with that. Okay, cool. Okay, so our case number one, guys, we've got mechanical low back pain. Um, and don't worry, there's more than just that. So we have a 28-year-old female. She's a rugby player who, after training two weeks ago, felt an ache in her lower back. She noticed this at the end of the training session, and it has persisted ever since. The following morning, she woke up and felt noticeably stiff and sore. She was unable to comfortably put on her shoes and socks, and bending forwards uh, was becoming more and more uncomfortable. She also felt like she couldn't stand up straight, so she ended up slightly bent forwards, but not able to bend all the way. This lady had no leg pain, no ridiculous symptoms, and no quarter equina symptoms either. Um, if anyone wants me to uh, go through that, type CES into the um, chat, and I can delve into that a little bit more. So aggravation was pain on full flexion, so down to her toes, on extension as well, so looking up and she was getting pain on lateral flexion as well. This is both passive and active. So essentially the end ranges of movement were giving her jib. Um, she felt easier when she was lying supine, so lying on her back and lying on her side. She was taking some over-the-counter painkillers and that seemed to help as well. This lady had no past medical history, which was remarkable and her red flag screen was negative. Cool. That's great. I'm going to take a, a casual yeah. pause. I would chew on my pipe at this point if I had. <laughs> yeah, that's just the poor guys you can imagine with this pipe sitting back in this rocking chair. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Story time, kids. Um, so this is a 28-year-old female who, after an exertion, uh, rugby specifically. Um, if any of you have ever watched female rugby, cast aside your assertions, because Christ, <laughs> they take some wallops. Um, and we've got this pain into extremes of extension, lateral flexion, and um, forward flexion as well. Um, is there anything which I should be looking out for in my next stage of um, examination. Brilliant. I can bring these up as they come along. Leslie, straight in there. Was there no impact or insult, she says? Uh, correct. There was no noticeable direct impact. However, she was playing rugby, so there could have been, but there wasn't that one that we are after when we asked that. It wasn't a, I did this and it happened. Just the usual amount. Good thinking, Leslie. I'm not sure you meant by insult. What, like somebody it's, told her yeah, you yeah, look yeah. terrible in their shorts? What's, what's the insult? <laughs> to clarify that, Leslie. But yeah, good question. Yeah. What was your as a uh, what was your initial thoughts then on this? Or were you thinking, right? I need to rule. You've mentioned that red flags was out. Carabiner. Was there anything else you wanted to rule out or check for based on the information you've given? Great question. Um, I think that uh, I may have seen a, a massive little uh, stick on here that says embellish. Um, so, uh, yeah, fantastic. Um, 
is this something that's happened before would be my, my first question. So is this a, right. uh, a chronic injury that's bubbled up and has been sitting underneath the surface waiting to, um, to present for some time? Or is this a brand new thing I think would be my first go to? Am I dealing with something deep in the weeds or is this truly a 48 hour issue that we've um, got a handle on here? Very nice. Yes, great, great thought. Um, Gary has put an interesting one here as well, which I'll bring up in real time. Gary Benson, founder of the SDA, says, was there any significant changes in behaviour activity in the days, weeks leading to the incident? I love the way people's minds work. This is great. Uh, we have had, that's fantastic, I've got an answer for that, Gary. Uh, we have had an increase in recent training because they have a tournament coming up. Oh, wonderful. It's one of the cases. Well done. Yes. Nice question, Gary. Not just a pretty face, it's six foot six. Wonderful. <laughs> uh, let's see what we've got here. Louise um, Aker has said in training, did she do a warm up? She did not. Our 28 year old was late that day, as had been working very hard at her desk job, um, and so had to put on her kit and run onto the pitch. Cool. Good. Good question, Louise. There. Yeah, that could be um, that could be an interesting route to pursue. Um, and Nikki, Nikki. Oh my gosh, you guys you have to stop typing. Going crazy on this. Right, Nikki. <laughs> let's have a little look. Nikki Mansfield has come in with possible multiple agonist and antagonist muscle spasm, but as to why, not sure yet. So muscle spasm. Um, Da, 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 da. Leslie Campbell, lack of sleep, stressed, question mark. Yeah, seeing if the the, the yellow flags maybe. Is Absolutely. yellow flags very high on your criteria? Do you check things like that? We would, um, dependent, they slide down the list somewhat for the more skeletal we're thinking. Um, however, we've got to we've got to have an adaptation or at least a, a strong arm on that BPS model because it does have a, a huge impact. The idea of, um, uh, so let's talk about like lack of sleep or stress, that's going to have the same amount of um, wear on a system as that 15th tackle. It will have the same amount of wear on the system, if not more than a poor diet that week. Um, whether it's chemical, emotional or physical, it all has the same strain on that end system. Um, so yeah, uh, well done, Leslie there. Um, I'm gonna say, yes, there is some increase in stress at the moment and sleep is not great. Interesting, 28 you say, yeah? Yes. Lovely. Okay. Uh, monthly cycle. Leslie's in there. Lovely. After last week's show. Good question, Leslie. I was kind of having a guy would jump in there before you, but you're in there. Monthly cycle. Hormone? Yeah. Come on, gents. Pick it up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you got to get very early to be Leslie. Yeah. Um, no changes to the monthly cycle. All is normal. No lateness. Um, we are at a um, uh, normal cycle rate, is what I've got. Great question, Leslie. Really cool. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. 28. Um, here we go. So Penny's in there going to constipation. Lovely. Good question as well. We talked about kind of um, cowed equine symptoms and things, but was there any anything else like constipation? or? There was not any changes to bowel, bladder, function or habits um, um, for any reason. Good, good question. Though. It's always worth getting that in there. Nice one, Penny. Um, Louise here says muscles stiff from sitting all day then straight into full exertion tight muscles also does she do anything else than does she do anything else than rugby I like that you know what other layers she um, got going on um this lady is a gamer so is it what, she's a, a gamer so a um uh someone who spends hours and hours playing video games oh right okay I'm showing my so age. I thought she was working on some farm. I was seeing like Yogi Bear or something. Oh. But no. Yeah, yeah, gamer. <laughs> the modern okay, gamer. Like a gamekeeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Old. Um, yeah, gamer. Okay. So she is a, a desk bound worker. She plays rugby. And then as soon as she's off the pitch, she's at home playing in her gamer chair. She, she spends more time seated at that 90 90 position. Wow. Look, that's interesting. That's so weird uh, because I no, wouldn't have expected that off a female rugby player. But then again, it's modern oh, 28, I suppose that is younger. It's quite young. Yeah, interesting. It takes all time. Now. She might be playing rugby games on the PlayStation. Who knows? Could be. Yeah, yeah, could be. If there is one. The rugby girls I used to know and, and work with in Spain, if they weren't playing rugby, they were normally like 
you know, platter drinking beer or something. It was kind I was of. I was going to say drinking was yeah. the, the main <laughs> drinking part of time. Drinking was the main part <laughs> time. Not seeing, watching video games. Okay, right. So, um, oh, here we go. Uh, Abe Turner has come in here. Does she do any strength loading for her back into flexion? Um, she does a basic strength routine in the gym, um, but no specific flexion activity. Um, so squats, upper body work, and deadlifts. Normally, there's no pain with these activities. Excellent. How did she play rugby just out of interest? This wasn't like a first game. She's, she's a regular player? And... No, she's a regular player. However, she has been upping her frequency because there's a tournament coming up. Tournament coming up. Okay, then. I'm going to take one more comment from there, and then we'll let you go in a little bit. This is a good question again from um, Penny. Um, has she got any children? Oh, has she got any children? No, hmm. uh, no children. No kids. Okay, right. Let's 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 hear from how your mind continued and what you did to continue the analysis. So, um, from here we would launch uh, <clears throat> into some orthopedic tests. Apologies, that's me leaning on my watch. Um, <clears throat> from here we would launch into some orthopedic testing of the lumbar spine, um, uh, looking for trying to differentiate between a clearly there's some muscle spasm and involvement in there we've got a, um, a pain into end range of movement um, and a, a loss of oh i haven't done that yet. <laughs> um, we've got some pain into end range of movement when we then orthopedically test her so we're going to get her to actively bend forwards backwards left and right we see that she's lost some of that natural um, active movement she stops due to pain specifically when leaning back she suddenly jars and feels like her back spasms again and says that's the pain doc that's what gets it where is she from this rugby player Just <laughs> <laughs> uh, the 1900s apparently yeah <laughs> yeah. She's, yeah um okay great so that was when she went into flexion did you say when she uh, sorry went to uh, when she went into extension yeah, Fair enough. That's we didn't get so. we didn't get to end range of lateral flexion or flexion because of the pain. She stopped, yeah. but on just um, initiating uh, zero or full degree of extension, she had that sudden jolt, back spasm again. She said, "That's the pain." How many days after the incident was this when she was seeing you? How many days had passed when she came in? So um, we're now two weeks later. Two weeks later, and she's still got that sensitivity. Okay, that's interesting. There's some other good questions here. We may just be doing this case history today. I hope you prepared for that because it's. <laughs> yes. I think it's really useful for people just to. It's lovely because people who don't think of these questions will now be adding them to their kind of like critical thinking. Gary came with a great one. There was a follow up. So, what position does she play? That's interesting. Is it really legal or union? We're talking here. Oh, crikey, are we? Uh, let's let's go for it. Uh, so she's got the union, um, and she's a flanker. Okay, flanker in the scrum then, yeah, like a wing on the, on the scrum. Uh, correct. Yeah, cool. cool, okay. I didn't go for um, cheap, And then Cecily is coming with a great follow-up question. Has she recently changed position? Or she just be no. increasing the amount of games? Yeah, um, so rather than a um, rather than increase or change of actual activity, it's a um, change in frequency. Okay, fine, that's good. Um, Brian, I don't know whether you're saying this to wind me up, or it's never the hip flexor, Brian. So I don't know what you're talking about there. I wonder if her service is short. It's never the hip flexor. You must have, you must know that thanks to our conversations with people. So we're just going to take that off there. I'm hoping it's not the hip flexor in this one <laughs> unique moment, but I'm pretty self sure it's, it's never the hip flexor. Um, da -da -da, yeah, li -li 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 -li. That's nice, interesting. Okay, let's go to this one here. Penny's jumped in here straight away with prolapse disc. So I'm keen to hear whether this was on your mind or not? Absolutely. So when we've got this kind of level of pain and um, accompanying dysfunction, I think we have to always have disc in the back of our mind. Mm -hmm. We did say that in the beginning there was no, uh, there wasn't any um, uh, ridiculous symptoms. However, a disc does not have to present with ridiculous symptoms straight off. It can be a, um, a slight uh, bulging of that annulus fibrosis, causing some pain whether it's against the surrounding ligaments. Um, it doesn't have to be a bulge hitting onto a nerve root for that classic, ridiculous, sciatica-type pain. Um, but I think anything 
back or cervical, certainly because of the mobility of those joints, we have to have this at least in the back of our minds. So how did you go ahead and either rule that out or did you do anything to, I'm thinking test-wise? Absolutely. So um, what we then look for classically was um, when we know that the range of motion, so we're sort of testing the whole body. So uh, range of motion is going to incorporate muscle, joint, disc, anything. We want to try and isolate those areas. So specifically, we can do some testing for the facet joints, so the nice weight-bearing, load-bearing joints in the back of the spine. Um, apologies, you guys know that. Um, uh, I'm impatient. Um, <laughs> I'm impatient. No, keep doing it. So, no, seriously. I mean, <laughs> some of our some of our listeners, uh, you know, probably are massage therapists, and they're not as familiar as other listeners with what you're talking about. So you're doing a grand job. Just keep keep talking. The level you are, it's amazing. It's really useful. Uh, um, <clears throat> so we we be looking at those um, facet joints. So uh, it's a, a particular move with some lateral flexion and extension, looking to essentially compress the facet joints in the lumbar spine to see if that specifically initiates pain. This is a passive move, by the way, so it theoretically isolates the facets and the joint um, structures comparative to the muscles. There's always going to be some muscles come along for the journey, especially when we're in a state of pain and spasm, but it's a an attempt at trying to differentiate between disc or nerve or muscle or um, pure joint. Let's all face it as well. We know that there's no such thing as pure joint, pure muscle, pure disc. They all go hand in hand. It's rare, if not impossible, to have just one. But which one's the head honcho and ruling the show is what we're after. So we look to differentiate. We can do discal testing, which is a provocative testing trying to draw the nerves um, uh, that possible cold, something called slumps test. I think it's actually been mentioned um, in, the, uh, in the chat there. There's slumps, there's well leg rays, uh, which is essentially looking to tension the sciatic nerve and femoral nerve against um, the uh, supposed disc bulge is a great way of um, uh, looking for it. Also, which position there is pain. The specific pain that um, this lady is feeling is on full extension, which is a classic sign of a facet joint irritation. But it could also be on the approximation or the um, uh, relaxation of the lumbar erectus, quadratus lumborum, multifidus, essentially all their muscles in her lower back, um, not to mention the, the glute structures and everything through the pelvis as well. We could also be thinking about the sacroiliac joints, let's not forget, uh, although the joints themselves have limited movement, the structures surrounding are fantastically well innovated um, and the ligament bridging across the back, back of those joints is famous for creating lots of pain, inflammation and discomfort. In this case, the sacroiliac joint provocation or surrounding provocation was negative, didn't cause her any pain. On palpation, so on prodding around there, she had a really specific pain over her L5 S1 facet joint and the surrounding musculature, musculature on the right hand side, specifically on palpation and a good old delve around, would recreate pain. Left side wasn't too bad. Okay, interesting. Okay, there's a Comment here. I'm sorry if I'm not going to everyone's comments, but I'm just trying to pick some out so we get the whole story. I was interested in this because we're aware now because of the BPS model and kind of catastrophization and fear. I'm interested mm -hmm. how you would take this into account. Leslie Campbell says, I think she has fear avoidance and she's guarding her movements and holding breath while moving, but I would have to see her. How aware are you of that? And what can you do to see whether there is a, a fear avoidance, a kinesophobia sort of thing, or what do you do? It's, it's a great question. Um, I think at two weeks and a high level of pain, I, I bet there is some fear avoidance, yeah. Um, whether it's a fear avoidance syndrome, so that tend, from my knowledge, it tends to be more of a, a long-term, so you know, if she's had it for two years, say, and doesn't want to extend, um, whereas I think we've said, you know, she, she goes to extend and is painful. I'm sure there is some fear avoidance. I think as someone who has 
unfortunately, rather regular bouts of um, low back pain because I do silly things in the gym, um, immediately you're going to have some fear avoidance of that provocative movement. So whether that's a full fear avoidance syndrome or whether it's a I don't want to get hurt today, Doc, um, is a real tough one. I think I would go on the chronicity. So if it's been there for two years and you say, look up or, you know, arch backwards and they go, no, thanks. I don't do that. Um, or very quickly you'll see in their movements, they'll be very rigid and they won't want to bend or, or extend at all. Um, comparative to if someone's done this in a relatively acute phase and you say, okay, have a go, try and lean back and they give it a go and go, oh, that was horrible. Um, I'd say that might be more of a mechanical or, or somatic onset comparative to um, sort of an embedded fear of, of movement. Great, great question though. It's, it's, it's a nice question there. It's worth yeah, bearing totally. in mind, isn't it? I, mean, I got this off Ben Cormack, who's going to be on the show next month when we look at focus on CPD in the UK. It was a long, long time ago, Shanghai, myself and Ben are, but I've used it so much for people who are fearing or, or with chesting or extension. You might well do it yourself, and, and I don't know whether Ben Cormack invented this, but just the difference of putting a wall behind you and something to point at when you're going to that extension. Because when you're just going back into an abyss and there's nothing behind you, even the normal person is going to be afraid, like, well, I can't see anything behind you. But when you start someone close to all and just get them to, I always kind of imagine it's a clock, so point to the 12, point to the 11, point to the other side, and then slowly get them to stand forwards a little bit and change their legs and kind of like, you know, just pain modification kind of stuff. And that can be a great way to see whether how much of it is, like you say, Lindsay, um, fit Leslie fearing it um, and whether mm. by changing it a little bit and, and occupying the mind with something else then they can achieve it or not or whether it indeed is like there's no way their body's going to let them kind of move into that position so great questions people these people will let you know as well they'll they'll come in and the first thing they say is i can't do this you know i, mm. I can't look up um either against a wall you can be behind them personally so you know get your body in your hand behind their low back and say don't worry you'll only go back a little bit i need to test it or my favorite because i'm a bit lazy guys do it in a chair don't even go to stand up for it. Just get them to, to sit up and arch their back slightly in a chair, and that will give mm -hmm. your starting point. Obviously, you then will need to follow up with a full test. But if that's enough for them to go, oh, I didn't like that, I probably wouldn't get him standing up for that fear of, well, if, if there's no one there to catch me, I'll be in pain and I'm going to fall over. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great stuff. Okay, well, the, 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 the clock is talking about clocks. It's going around so quickly. So, yeah, give us some more yeah. information. Lead us closer to the, uh, the the light at the end of the tunnel. What do you do next? So, um, uh, because we're great thorough clinicians, we did do some reflexes. Oh, no. You Have you got me there, Matt? Yeah, I can still hear you. Your camera's frozen a bit, but I can still hear you. Oh, fantastic. I'll crack on that. Okay, so um, we did do some reflexes, and um, uh, we did some... Uh, uh, some muscle testing and we also did some sensory testing as well everything was clear and as uh, expected you could say um what we then did was a further check through her musculature specifically her lumbar erectors ql and right glute med were what i would call spasmodic but essentially they were tight and hurty is the most important thing putting a thumb in there, they felt different comparative to the left side, um, and they elicited a ooh, ah, that's the bit uh, response from said patient. Glenn mentioned oh, sorry, QL, so yeah, you mentioned that QL earlier, so it was, uh, yeah, palpation produced an ooh, ah sound, um, specifically on the right side where she was having problems doing flexion on that side, wasn't it? So. That's where we are. Good now, questions. I'll, yeah, I will. Um, I will get in trouble for saying this, guys, because uh, Rob is, um, the, like I said, the brains, and he's certainly the um, uh, the one who's more up to date on his uh, testing. However, the biggest test is often: did you poke it? Mm -hmm. So, is it a QL? When, when we look at the sensitivity and the specificity of these, it's hard to say um, of of these neuroorthopedic testing. Often, they're not actually the most sensitive or specific tests. However, I always find that if you poke it and it's painful, it's probably involved. Um, it, I know that sounds silly, but let's start off basic. 
is it cute? Well, we could do the one arm out and the leg down and this. Yeah, but you just poke it. And then they go, oh, that's the one. If you haven't, if they haven't left the room and said the words, ooh, that's the one, have you really made a diagnosis? You know, um, that would be a, um, uh, one of my best provocative tests. And actually, hey, look, we're here as well. If we're going to stick to this one test, I'm going to stick an extra few nuggets in for you. Everything is testing. So Nikki Mansfield there, you said provocative testing is super valuable. It is. But your provocative test doesn't have to be Kemp's specific 45 degree rotation and extension. Your provocative test starts when you greet that patient. How did they stand up out of the waiting room chair? Your provocative test is your walking behind them on the stairs up to the treatment room. How are they walking? Have they got a slight limp? Are they shuffling? Do they very gingerly walk around the corner because they don't want to move their neck? Provocative tests don't have to start in the room. They should start the moment you grip that person's hand and notice a slight weakness. Um, th this is something we, we were teaching in team training the other day. Provocative testing starts second one. That's what it should be. So if they can't get up the stairs because they've got foot drop, don't start them on calf raises because obviously they're not going to have that. But your, your provocative testing started the moment you met them. Um, it doesn't have to have a test name to go on your patient notes and to inform your end diagnosis. Really good. Yeah, really important. Keep going. Look at this. It. Cool. Oh, yeah, we, we should finish this. Otherwise, it'll end on a, a cliffhanger. You can't do time. that to us. That'd be um, possible. But, I mean, <laughs> it's, even though we planned a few <laughs> case histories, the, the, your passion and your delivery is so good. I think one is going to be fantastic. Everyone's kind of thinking and, and well into this. So, yeah. Keep going, man. It's really good. Okay, we're doing good. Um, okay, so um, we, uh, so we, we've ruled out all of our red flags. We've ruled out all of the nasties. Um, <clears throat> discal, I can't remember if I said it, but discal um, uh, provocative taste testing and nerve provocative testing for the lower limbs was all a negative. Mm -hmm. So what we've got is a positive facet joint provocation test and a positive, a positive Dave, I've poked that facet and uh, the surrounding area is very painful test. And we've got um, uh, painful and um, hyperactive or hyper-responsive musculature surrounding that area, causing pain on palpation. We have a rather classic mechanical normal onset of facet joint irritation with surrounding, uh, we can call it myofascial pain, we can break it down into QL and um, uh, QL lumbar erector multifidus and um, piriformis spasmodic tension. I don't know how your um, uh, or reactive pain syndrome. It depends on your diagnosis classification. What we've got here is an overload of a joint and surrounding musculature. Which one is head honcho? Well, in the diagnostic terms, normally we put the joint first and the muscle second. It tends to go disc, nerve, joint, muscle, just because it does. Um, or at least that's how I write it. So, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, what I would call relatively simple. So there's probably been an overloading of that system. We've got poor sleep, poor warm up, um, uh, not a fantastic lifestyle around what should be great exercise. Um, what should be the savior can sometimes be what tips you over the net, especially if you spend a lot of time in that seated 90-90 position. Um, what we would look to do is some treatment. Now, that treatment is what you guys know. So whether that is a, um, uh, a hands-on manipulative therapy or whether it's soft tissue treatment to that area, then I would expect some sort of gentle rehabilitation of that excitation movement. So we want to create some ease into extension and end ranges of lateral flexion and forward bending flexion. Um, so whether that is a, a gentle escalation of just active range of movement at home, if you know McKenzie um, exercises, it could be that. It could be a classic prayer stretch followed into a bird dog. If I've got any yogis in the house or Pilates, I'm not sure which team that is. Um, essentially, what we want to do is open up that movement. We know that when we irritate a joint like this, it's going to be pretty pissed off for the next, I mean, this is two weeks later, 
we've got anywhere up to four to six weeks of that joint being annoyed. The best thing we can do to push this forwards to um, expedite that <coughs> um, phase of pain and avoidance is to create gentle graded movement further into that area of pain just into it i don't like to push too deep into pain um, especially for um, non-professional athletes um, and some soft tissue work around the area i don't tend to work straight into strength exercises at the start i like to relax calm shit down first as adam meekin says then build it up afterwards um, but the biggest thing has to be to repeat that um, aggravating movement gently and try and increase and escalate time by time. That's, in my um, uh, humble opinion and in the research as well, the quickest way to expedite this inflammatory aggravated process and get that person back to movement. What we don't want to happen is that fear avoidance set in. It's all very well when we say, hey, do you know what? these things are self-limiting and they do tend to be self-limiting so bugger off oh, i'm swearing sorry um you know go away Wait, for right. six weeks and it will go away well yeah okay it's calmed down however um what we haven't done is address that that pain movement we haven't addressed the fact that it hurt when i did this so will she happily go back to it um yeah and then we want to be thinking about what's happening around that so Let's say we've got her good to go back to rugby. All right. So, and I can actually see this has just popped up. So you beat me to it, Gary Benson. This is Gary, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. In there. So I'm just going to read out Gary's question, if you like, because <laughs> that's wicked. That's about where I was going. Cheers, mate. You really cut me up there. Um, so what about the 162 other hours in her week? Exactly. It's not the rugby that did it, or rather that might not be the main factor. We want to look at how is she sitting is she mobilizing herself properly during the day? If she is one of these gamers that spends hours um, a night on their computers or whatever medium they use to do it, um, then are they getting regular movement breaks? Are they, uh, we call them movement snacks, which I really like because I'm a food driven being. Um, so are they getting movement snacks? Are they doing some sort of exercise, quote unquote, to stop them from solidifying into that space so their body's not in such bloody shock when it comes to playing a game of rugby? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's very nice. But it's, it's again, it's, you can only address those hours. I'm still doing the maths in my head just to check, but I'm sure he's right. Um, if you've done your subjective, because if you haven't, I mean, a lot you if you hadn't asked enough questions, and you might not have found out that she spends a long time playing video games or something, you could have missed that out, and you could have done some wonderful manual therapy on her and and told her to do rice and all this, and not even realise that she's going back to maybe just sitting down for hours in a fixed position and not getting that movement in there. So. It kind of highlights again, doesn't it, the importance of the subjective and getting to know the individual rather than just going straight to that back and seeing what hurts and focusing solely on that kind of like, you know, five square inches or something. I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I'm worried that I warned <laughs> people up thinking this was going to be like um, a mysterious outcome or something we weren't expecting. But um, that's because we had three lined up. But in this one, it's kind of satisfying in the sense that if you had done your evidence informed kind of assessment then and looks everything then it's kind of like the pieces come together quite naturally the jigsaw comes together as long as you're looking at all the pieces so i think it's a fine example of that um obviously we don't i mean i was thinking like return to play it depends on lots of other factors mm -hmm. but for the moment when she's coming in here and she hasn't got that presumably i'm thinking like real life now there's still this tournament coming up Okay, so that's going to annoy you a little bit. Is she, which, when she came to see you, was she still hoping or wanting to play in this tournament? Or, oh, she's, she's playing. She's that? playing whether you she like it or not. You know what these sports people are like. Um, they give you a deadline. They give you a fact. I will be playing in a tournament in six weeks' time. Um, Is that what it was? How long, how long away from when she saw you? Um, I, I, tell you what, I just made that up on the spot, actually. Yeah, let's call it six weeks' time. You've okay, got yeah, six yeah. weeks to get her match ready or mm. near enough. Yeah, yeah. So what sort of things do you, in an ideal world, if you could just have the perfect patient, you would progress it gradually and or according to, you know, what works with their body. But when you have got an athlete who, you know, wants, needs to play in this, and it's not like a, um, a maybe or they definitely need to play, how would you accelerate that return 
so she's as fit as possible when she returns to that game. It's, a, it's an interesting one. I suppose one of the biggest things is the, the mentality of that athlete walking into the game. So you've, if they think they have an injury, they'll tend to overcompensate. So what I, I would be looking for is when we're looking at return to play, now I don't, I, I don't work with athletes to the point where I have to write return to play um, uh, signatory letters or anything, but just from a, like a, a casual weekend warrior who wants to play more rugby for a big tournament, not an official sponsored athlete. Um, return to play has to be when you're comfortable. Um, so like if you're going back in uncomfortable, we've got to make sure that a you're not you're not overcompensating to the point where you're you're clearly going to get injured and you, you're kind of putting yourself in harm's way. Um, and B, if you can do the required activity without pain, we should be fine. So if, let's say this person is, um, uh, let's switch her position up quickly and say, you know, she's a prop forward. She's, she's lifting people up in, um, in a line out, for instance. She's got to be able to be able to replicate that without pain um, or replicate it with enough or minimal pain where she doesn't have to massively overcomplicate, uh, overcompensate. So whether that's testing it out in the gym first or picking up a mate, I don't know. Um, mm. But the idea is, are you comfortable both physically and mentally to head back into those games? And as well, are you cognizant of the fact that this could irritate again? And sometimes you'll tell people, this is too soon. You know, I, I don't recommend it. There's nothing you can do to stop them. And often they say, oh, yeah, I won't go then. And you'll see them the next week and they've, they've got the scars from the game and they, oh, I did it anyway. Um, so often it, it's just make sure that they're cognizant of it could irritate them. You know, you weren't, because you've still got pain, there's a chance, a quite high chance that actually this may reoccur or come back even worse. Um, and as long as they're happy with that, or possibly happy is the wrong word, but as long as they're clear on that fact, I think you're sort of covered both um, uh, from a legal standpoint and from a, a mental standpoint as well. That's cool. That's really interesting. Yeah. So normally you'd say, right, if an ideal world would have, I don't know, 12 weeks before you start playing gently again, you're going to tell me you're going to jump into the line outs and prop in in six weeks. So we need to kind of get your body ready to take some of that now, maybe accelerate the progressions a little bit just so you don't you know, go onto the pitch. And then as soon as you do, exert yourself too much your body's just gonna go forget that so yeah you need to prepare it that's cool and i like the mental approach as well you you want to if you know they're going to go back on then do what you can to uh, prepare them mentally and not be too fearful of their body and stuff great really good i enjoyed that did you enjoy that people i thought it was amazing um but it is 903 unfortunately well, it's gonna have to be a part two of this dude it's like you know maybe when when bob's around again because we've still got Another two to get through. I was going to say, yeah, we've got, we've got two more hanging on the wire here. Yeah. <laughs> what a hook. God, it's like bloodline. I'm, I'm just about to finish off episode uh, series two of that. It's fantastic. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, really good. Thanks, mate. That's really, I love the way you deliver it as well. Very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, it's it's uh, yeah, good to talk to you guys. And, um, uh, yeah, final plug for the Back Pain and Injury podcast. I had to stick it in there again, didn't I? Um, unbelievable nuggets and pearls of wisdom for, um, uh, for any therapist, uh, give it a listen, and I appreciate in advance your five star review. There we go. I think if people listen to the podcast, um, um, yeah, well, you've given a fine example of what what, what it's going to be like on the podcast um, with your voice and your way of explaining things and your attention for detail and that. So, so yeah, it's going to be great. Well recommended, people. Right. So before I sign you out, um, just to let you know that obviously next. Tuesday we're beginning a new month we're already into April so as is traditional we'll be uh, having Tim Allardyce in the studio for Ask Tim and um, Tim doesn't like to kind of blow his own trumpet as anyone uh, any of you who know him will realize and know but as it happens we have my patient have just released a new massive section on strength and conditioning and rehab um, and I've had a little look through it and it's great. I mean, it's, I mean, I'm not saying everybody should now run out and get rehab by patient clinical software, but 
I want him to talk about it and talk about what he put into it and what people can get out of it. And I said, it's not because we're trying to sell the have my patient, because that's the last thing he wants to do with these Ask Tim episodes. But it's just going to be a really interesting episode for people who are either already prescribing exercise to their patients or thinking about ways they can help adherence with the patient for them to actually do the exercise. Are you drawing stick men or do you want to print something out? Um, how do you give them these exercises? So I've told Tim, I've twisted his, his arm and said, no, you're going to have to talk about the latest release and we have my patient. So we will be doing that uh, when we get Tim in on the first Tuesday of the month, which will be April the 4th. Um, so I think it'll be a good shout out. But like I say, I promised to Tim I'd say this, it's not a sales pitch for we have my patient. There's plenty of other exercise prescription software out there. We're just going to use it as an example to show what you can get out from investing in whatever you want to in terms of helping your clients with strength and conditioning exercises. So that will be um, next Tuesday. But for now, um, don't go away yet, um, Dave. I'm going to shut down the lounge and they then say thank you to you personally. But yeah, for everybody else in the live lounge, thanks for joining us. Um, again, ma magnificent questions, um, fantastic questions, and great for sharing your thoughts. Um, and if you are listening to the podcast and you've enjoyed it and you want to join live to be part of this, then, yeah, just head along to the Sports Therapy Association YouTube channel at 8 o'clock, and that's British Standard Time now, which I think is GMT plus one in case you're joining us from abroad. That's it for now. Uh, take care of each other, and hopefully we'll see some of you next week. Thanks, guys.